recording? It is. Yay. So we're going to talk about communities. Communities, quite simply, all the things that we are going to be tested on, there's a lot of terminology. I know it looks terrifying. So communities don't involve the abiotic. They involve the biotic. So biotic is anything that is, was, or could be alive. Communities turn out to be whenever you have different populations interacting. Which is what we deem to be biotic. How they end up interacting is a biotic factor. You do not get biotic factors if you don't interact. When you end up interacting with each other, what immediately becomes apparent is the idea and the actual phenomenon of an ecological niche. Some say it's a niche, some say a niche. Which one is it? Oh no. If you want to be pretentious, pretentious, it's a niche. You don't want to sound pretentious, call it a niche. Whatever. It's you don't pronounce the E, so you can't say like, oh, it's a niche. Like that that one doesn't work. But you know, whatever. An ecological niche, to make it as simple as possible, is what's your job? What is your job? Meaning in this community, in where you happen to live, what is your job? My job is to eat stuff. Eat what? Be picky. Where are you getting it from? Do you eat all the time or do you only eat at certain times of the year? As picky as you can get, that is your ecological niche. The thing about your niche is it can come in two flavors. You can have what's known as a realized niche. This turns out to be reality. And you can have an idealized niche. which is where you could be, where you could execute your job. For some species, their realized and their ideal perfectly co coincide. For others, their idealized niche is much, much bigger than their realized niche. When that happens, when those two do not match up, that means something is hindering you from your full potential. What's the hindrance? Biotic factors are the things that are holding you back. This starts to come into conflict with organisms whenever we happen to have introduced species. Introduce species, meaning we bring something in that is not endemic to the area. I assume you all know the word endemic. Okay, so endemic means naturally, meaning evolved, found in a location. And you can contrast that by saying something that is not endemic. So carnivores are not endemic, at least, and by carnivores I mean mam mammalian carnivores, are not endemic to New Zealand. So the islands of New Zealand, there are no mammal. Mammals are not found there. So if there are rats that are that are appearing there, that's because they were introduced. If there are cats there, that's because they were introduced. If there are dogs there, that's because they were introduced. Introduced species 
virtually always, and I have to say virtually always because I'm sure there's an exception to it, although I can't imagine it, these will disrupt natural niches. Australia. What is their version of the rabbit? That's right. It's called a kangaroo. A kangaroo is the Australian rabbit. Well, hunters from England, when we went down there and said, yes, yes, let's claim this place. Yes, yes, Oz. And they wanted to hunt stuff because do like a jolly good chap and you need to shoot good sport. You look at the things that are there and you're like, I don't know what any of these things are. So let's bring some rabbits with us. Well, the rabbits got out and they are out competing. They are reducing the niches of the endemic species of Australia to the point where the rabbits are eating the food for what belongs there and they are going extinct. The catch with introduced species is they usually drive things towards extinction. In a normal situation where we're not having introduced species, Typically, what will happen is when species meet each other, one of two things is going to happen. You're either going to fit into a niche. You might need to adjust it a little bit, but you're going to fit in somewhere. Or you're just going to go extinct because you just can't keep up. So if another species comes on in and wants to be in your niche, you either can hold your ground, change, or die. Those are going to be your three choices. Hold your ground, change, or die. And you meaning your species, not you, the individual. When you run into another species, those adaptations, we give different terms. Once on all of those terms, we dub interactions, but some type of biological interaction. So all organisms, when you run into something else, we're going to interact with each other. Why do you have to interact? The main reason is there's only so much stuff to go around. And by stuff, we mean resources. The simple definition of a resource are things you need to survive. We can basically make a list of three things that are essential for all living things to survive. They are food, they are shelter, they are space. You run out of food, you die. You have no way to protect yourself from the environment, especially when the environment goes harsh. You will die. If you are too cramped, you will die. One of the things that people have been worrying about in zoos is keeping elephants at the zoos. Because we know that elephants, it seems by all normal metrics, are perfectly healthy, will just drop dead in a zoo. And the question is, why are they dropping dead? Because they have nothing that appears to be wrong. The only thing that we can tie into it is their space. Because we know that wild elephants usually take up the space of, like, Orange County. They take huge amounts of space. So when you say, yes, let's put it onto a one-acre plot of land, it's just not enough space for them. Why is it cruelty to put orcas into a tank at a sea world? Because they migrate the length of Cal of not California, they migrate the length of North America. But you're going to stick them into a tiny tank. Why are they going crazy and things are going wrong with them? They have space issues. If you the whole idea if we were to turn this towards people, the idea of solitary confinement. When we 
incarcerate people or we stick you in a box that's effectively the size of in terms of dimensions wise like twice the size of that fume hood that's not enough space for a human it's cruel you are killing them by putting them into too small of a space so usually people blow this last one off it's a big one we just don't understand it as much so we have to interact because there's only so much food shelter and space to go around sometimes we're going to fight over that food sometimes we're going to fight over that shelter sometimes we're going to fight over the space when you are interacting with each other we give those interactions names do any of you know any of the names that we give to these types of interactions because you've heard of them the easiest is when you fight. But we have a better word instead of fight. It starts with a C. Because it sounds smarter. It's a competition. Perfect. Competition is one of those interactions. We have other words. One of them starts with an M. One of them can start with a P. One more time. Mutualism. Perfect. Which is like, oh, I, just, I know some of these words. So what are some of the others? Yep. Parasitism. It's a, you hear the start of the answer, you're like, yep, that's already the right answer. You don't even need to finish the word. There's some others. Let's start easy. Let's fight. So competition is direct conflict over those resources. So this is a direct conflict. Conflict is going to result in a few options. You're either going to die, or you're going to need to adapt. Again, what are we competing about? Resources, food, shelter, space. Because there's only so much food, shelter, space. Well, the die part, okay, yeah, we can explain that one. So the adaptation, how could you adapt? Option number one is you can get excluded. We can just say, change just a little bit. Change what? Change your niche. Perfectly legit option. I want to sit here and I want to eat food. Oh, there's a whole bunch of people who show up here at noon every day. Okay, don't show up at noon then. Change the time that you would show up to feed. That's technically changing your niche. You're shifting something about what you do. Easy enough. Or instead of going after the tree itself, go after what falls on the ground. Same food, just directly from the source or after the source gave it up. Option number two is you can get displaced. So displacement is you're just moved out of the way. This ain't your tree, move to another tree. When we start looking at lizards, lizards show this actually quite often. You can have multiple species of lizards that eat effectively the exact same thing. And a lot of them just literally displace each other just a little bit. And like, oh, no, no. My niche is I only eat insects that are found at the very bottom of the tree. Well, I eat insects that are a foot off the, the bottom of the tree. Well, I eat insects that are on the bottom leaves of the tree. Well, I eat insects that are at the top of the tree. Even though they're the same insects, it's just where they're located. All they're doing is being displaced. And different species will say, nope, this is my spot. This is where my niche is realized. This is going to be, we're going to see this with birds when we go to Bolsa Chica. We can actually test if you get shoved out of the way or not. And we do this by looking at barnacles. 
So we have two different species of barnacles. We don't you don't need to remember this experiment, or at least how it's done. It's just how would you do this? So is there a competition between these two types of barnacles? Are they fighting for the same space, the same set of resources? So you can have a hypothesis. The two niches are based upon displacement. So we're explaining why we see some of them up high and some of them down low. They're fought each other, and the result of them fighting is some took the high ground, some took the low ground. They had a displacement. Well, how would you test this particular hypothesis? If it's displacement, meaning one shoved the other out, what would you need to do? If one of them pushed you out of the way, and now you're living over there instead of over here, how could I test that I pushed you out of the way? But if I'm still here, I'm going to shove you right back, if that's the case. So what do you need to do? Get rid of me. You get rid of me, and I'm the one who's shoving you out. I'm causing you to be displaced. If you remove me from the equation, shouldn't you move back? Okay. So, we have the ones that are up high, we have the ones that are down low. What if I hit delete on them? If I delete the ones that are sometimes in the water or in the water more often, what do we see? These high tide ones will take over the entire area. So, the experiment is remove the Belenus barnacles. And if you remove them and you then look at what happens to the distribution of the other set of barnacles, if they held to their own spot, meaning if they stayed up here, then it's not because they pushed them out. It's just this is, this is their niche and they're good with it. Their idealized niche is their realized niche. But if I remove these ones and they spread out, their idealized niche and their realized niche are not identical. Again, realized where you are, idealized where you could be. So what do we end up deciding? Are they picking the high tide because they wanted it or because they were forced? They were forced into it. How would you do these statistics? H how would you test this? We have a before and an after. Obviously, I'm now thinking test. The t-test. This is screaming out loud, let's do a t-test. In particular, since I have a before and an after, this could be a paired t-test. What would I want to measure? Well, if I'm looking at their area, shouldn't I just measure like the amount of square footage or whatever that they occupy? Seems perfectly logical. You could do that. So when we make these claims of, oh, there's interactions and it could be by exclusion or displacement, how do we know? We can experimentally figure this out. We just need to find a little plot of area and manipulate just that tiny plot and see what happens. But you obviously also would need to wall this section off so that nothing else is really coming in to interfere. Option number two is rather than direct fighting, we can exploit you. So an exploitation is going to be something where I'm going to take advantage of a situation. Option number one of how I can take advantage of you. So I can just eat you. Predation is typically 
considered to be animal on animal. Or something after animal. So it doesn't need to be animal on animal, but it could be like a plant on an animal or a fungus going after an animal. Big deal. You need to be eating another animal. The catch then becomes with predation, how do you fight back? The main ways that we fight back against predation have to do with the idea of mimicry. And mimicry is fun. So mimicry, you're trying to blend in. You're trying to act like something else. So what could you do? You could be a cryptic mimic. Something's trying to eat you. So what do you have to do? Hide. Cryptic mim mimicry is hiding. Another version, what we call a posomatic coloration. Posomatic coloration is you, instead of hiding, you say, I'm right here. And organisms that tend to say, I'm right here, and don't pretend to hide, are usually dangerous. When you are unwilling to hide, you're okay being out in the open and being bright and shining and telling everything, I'm right here, go ahead. I dare you usually isn't a good battle plan. So posomatic coloration are bright. Bright colors because they are dangerous. Bright colors in nature are usually a bad sign. Mm -hmm. They usually can perceive it better than we do. But well, it depends on what animal you're talking about. With that. We're talking about mammals. Eh, we're not particularly great at that. But if we're talking like insects, oh yeah, they're really good at that. Birds, excellent at it. Most, if we get away from mammals and where something on land, they see colors we can't imagine. Because we have no ability to imagine what infrared or ultraviolet looks like. But they can see it. The catch with these two, hiding and being bright, hiding, you don't need to worry about that. But this bright color, this produces a weird pattern. So bright equals I'm dangerous. So what we end up getting is a type of evolution that's referred to as convergent evolution. where you have different things that give you the same answer. They're coming at it from different results, but they give you the same end product. What we end up seeing is there's a bunch of dangerous species that all end up looking the same. They all have the same type of bright coloration. And we would call that Molarian mimicry. All the dangerous things look similar to each other. If I have an insect flying at your face and it is brightly yellow colored, are you going to say, oh, let me stop and let me catch it upon my hand? And I shall gaze upon it and say, oh, what a beautiful insect that is yellow. What are you going to do? When that thing's shooting right at your face, because what are you thinking? You're thinking B. But what else could it have been? Could be a wasp. What else could it be? A hornet. Are you willing to say hello, chef's kiss to you too, if one of those is coming at your face? Probably not. But all three of them have the same coloration of F around and find out. So you have this yellow thing shooting at your face. And you're like, no, 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 no. But if you stopped and looked at it, you'd realize, wait a second. It has the wrong number of wings. It doesn't have the right number of wings to be a bee, a hornet, or a wasp. 
There's only two wings on this thing. That isn't something that's going to sting me. It's a fly. Would flies do that? Have a bright yellow fly? The answer is, of course. We call that Batesian mimicry, where there's nothing wrong with you. You are perfectly harmless. But you are hoping other things are terrified of your mimicry. You are using something else to be scary, and you're just riding along the coattails. You look like you're dangerous, but you're not. So, if you were to look at these two here, so obviously we have some type of caterpillar and we have a snake. You look at the two, they look shockingly similar to each other. What are they attempting to do? Well, this one here, it's bright green saying, go ahead, mess with me. This one here is, please don't eat me. I don't want to get eaten. But it will mimic, it will make part of its body look like it's a snake. The result is, you don't mess with this. This is just it all swollen up and it's crawling underneath. This is its back. Nature does that all the time. Where this one here is baiting you to think that it's dangerous, when in reality it's not. Batesian mimicry, I'm fooling you to thinking that I'm dangerous, but I'm not really that dangerous. Okay, so what else can we have to worry about with exploitation? Well, predation is, let's go eat an animal. So what do we call it if you eat a plant? We call it herbivory. Herbivory, or herbivory if you're British, is you eat a plant. Some plants are good with it. Some plants have evolved to want you to eat them. Others say no. Well, how can the plant fight back? It can't just get up and move. So it needs to have either some type of physical defense or, more likely, because they are excellent at this, they're poisonous. Poison versus toxin. Difference. Because they are not interchangeable. You cannot call it something toxic. You cannot necessarily say it's poisonous. Say that one more time. Yes. Toxin is aggressive. Poison is defensive. So poison, things that are poisonous, you kind of need to ask for it. I have a good one for you that. Then we have the last one, which is among the best of them all, parasites. Oh, when we talk about uh, animal digestion, oh, oh, the fun we're going to have. I have all the pictures when it comes to parasitic worms. If you have never seen parasitic worms before, you are in for a treat. Oh, you're in for a treat. Oh! So parasite is the, the epitome of exploitation. It is using another's, basically, essence to stay alive. You eat the food, you had to capture it, you had to digest it, and I'm just going to sit there, live inside your intestines, and suck all of that goodness out of your intestines. You're doing all the work, and I reap all of the benefit. It always will need a host. Sometimes the host, you'll be inside the host. Sometimes you'll be outside the host. You all had the pleasure of looking at uh, the Agnatha 
last semester in 175, the jawless fish. So name me jawless fish. Do you name any of them? There's like two. So both of them have sucky mouths because they don't really have jaws, so they can't. So one of them, lamprey, the other famous one, is the hagfish. Hagfish goes after alive or dead. Dead. So the lamprey goes after living things. What do they do? Clasp onto your side, and they grind a hole into you. And they just feed off of whatever falls into their mouths. They're a parasite. You do the eating and growing, and they just let it all dump on into them. Lovely. There's an explanation behind parasitism, or at least evolution with parasitism, and it's awesome, called the Red Queen Hypothesis. There's a book you can read. Do you all know what the Red Queen is of Alice in Wonderland? There's two Alice in Wonderland books. You have the Queen of Hearts, and then you have the Red Queen. They are not the same. Queen of Hearts is book one. Red Queen is book two. Book two is the one that comes with the Jabberwocky and all the fun that comes with that. I have one nod. I don't know if that's a you actually have any clue what I'm talking about. So you probably have heard of it because of this Tim Burton movie. The only reason I'm... Uh, that's a as to know any of that. Um, the red, so the first book is based upon playing cards. The second book is based on chess. And in it, Alice meets the Red Queen. And the Red Queen's like, oh, do you want to become a queen too? And she's like, yes. Well, what you have to do is if you're a pawn playing the game of chess, how do you become a queen? You have to make it to the other end of the board. So that's what you try and do throughout the second book of Alice in Wonderland. So the Red Queen takes Alice by the hand and then they start running. The catch is they're running in place. But there's wind and they're getting out of breath and they're feeling just exhausted and they're like floating in the air running so fast. But they don't move anywhere. They stay in position. In biology, we read that story and we said, that, that right there explains parasites. A children's book explains parasites perfectly. And like I said, it's called the Red Queen Hypothesis. Well, what is it? For a parasite to cause you harm, it needs to have access to you. So you are harmed by this parasite. This is not good. It is benefits, you lose. So what do you need to do through evolution, meaning the next generation? You need to deny access. How do you deny access? You need to come up with a new combination of genes. Because if you change your genetic makeup, you might get a better combination of all the thousands of genes that we have that might, just might, deny access, which give, makes you better off. The problem becomes that parasite is now on the losing end of this. So which ones are you going to kill off? Only the ones that have no access. Well, how are they going to possibly gain access? They also need to go through a sexual recombination so that maybe one of them has the key to gain access. You ran away from them, and they caught right back up with you. So what do you need to do to survive? You need to run away again. And what do they need to do to survive? Catch right back up. We are running a race to stay in the same spot. We run away from the parasite, and the parasite runs to keep up with us, which is the Red Queen. We learn biology from kids' books.
it's interesting to look at how Malarian and Batesian mimicry manifest. So I, I just want to show you some stuff. So Malarian, that's the one where I'm dangerous, you're dangerous, we both know we're dangerous, and we just happen to converge to look the same. So we have a wasp, don't get stung. We have a bee, don't get stung. Yellow, yellow, yellow equals warning. I see yellow. So I look at that and say, oh no, I don't like it. These wings are built differently than those wings are. So if I look at this one, I'm like, wait a second, it's different. If I look at it even more, I realize it's a fly. But it looks just like the other ones. These two are mimics, but the way that they're mimics is just convergent evolution. This one is a mimic because, in a sense, it's a parasite of how they behave. It's a parasitic parasite in terms of appearance, which is weird. What's that? It's a hand. I got it. Thank you. What else is that? Octopus. Do you know the species? Yes, we call it a blue ringed octopus. We named it such, as you can tell, because of this arm right here. Or it's because it's covered in blue rings. Where do you find them? Where ocean? That's right, Australia. Find in Australia. Next thing that pops in your mind is, oh, so it kills you. And the answer is, yes. All octopuses are venomous. All of them are venomous. All of them can inject you with stuff. This one is particularly aggressive about it. How do you know it wants to bite you? These rings that look kind of bright, they start flashing, they start pulsing. When you start seeing like shiny blue flashing throughout its body, it's angry and it's going to bite. And if you were to have one crawling on you, which it would not be happy about, it would do its best to get away from you, but if you were to let it crawl on you, they know how to find a neck and that's where they tend to bite. There, have you ever heard of the Darwin Awards? If you don't, your homework this weekend is look up the Darwin Awards and enjoy reading the Darwin Awards. They are basically, oh, you stupid. And what do you do? Oh, yeah, you stupid. That's why we had to eliminate you from the gene pool. That's what they are. There are lots of people who go to Australia, see one of these, and say, oh, it's so pretty. I want to pick it up. And they do, and it's fine until you start taking it really away from the water or you start to see it pulsing like, okay, I'm kind of done. It's kind of like a cat. You know how you see the cats and its pupils get really big and the ears start going backwards? And you're like, oh, you're so cute. You want to play with me more. Until the cat then lets you know, I am done with my interaction with you. These will do the same thing except you'll die. What's that? I know it's a doll. Oh, it's a doll. It's a cheetah cub. What do you notice about the cheetah cub? It has a mohawk. Don't you like the mohawk? And it's white colored. Why would it have a white mohawk? One more time. So it's not the hyena. It's something more terrifying. The badger. So, have any of you ever seen what a honey badger does? They like honey. So they go to honey hives, and they rip them open, and get their honey. What about the bees? What about them? Aren't they going to be, like, angry and sting it? Yeah. It doesn't care. It is more than willing to get stung by however many bees it takes so it can get its honey. And if something that charges into beehives and says, 
bring it, how are you going to react if it wants to charge you? The answer is, you don't stand a chance. They will kill a lion with very little issue. Lions see them and they say, nah, I'm good, and they'll go the other way. These things are evil. What do we call them in North America? Especially if you go up north into Canada or into Alaska. We don't call them badgers, although they're relatives. We call them wolverines. And wolverines are not known for their playful temper. Because they will kill anything they don't like, and they don't like anything. This is a defense mechanism. It looks like a badger. Cheetahs, if you go to a zoo and you see a cheetah, they always have a dog with them. You know the story behind that? Cheetahs are terrified of everything. Wait, cheetahs are predators. Yes, but things eat cheetahs. The other big cats look at a cheetah. If you have a cheetah that does a zero to 70 sprint, it's not going to move for a couple of hours because it's kind of done, which means it's fair pickings. Cheetahs are prey, so they need some type of mimicry to protect themselves. And they protect their young using Batesian mimicry to make the young look like they're badgers. Because a lion, a lioness would look at a cheetah and say, yeah, I'll eat that. Lioness looks at a badger and says, I'll starve. I'm good. So if you make the young look like a badger, they're safe. Then you have this plant. This plant is amazing. This is, of course, also in Australia. And if you look at it, it's fuzzy. Plants that are fuzzy like this, we give them a name. We have versions of them here, too. Here they look tiny and they're weed-like. They're usually, you look at them, you're like, oh, I'm going to grab it by my hand because I'm weeding it in my garden, and you immediately regret grabbing onto them. We call them nettles. And they have little barbs that stick in your hands, and they're like little itty bitty needles. And you're like, ah, that, like it hurts, and you can't close your hand because you have barbs now stuck in your hand. You have to get them all out so it doesn't get infected. Well, the ones in Australia, Australians are funny. So we have this plant. Its common name is called Gimpy Gimpy. Doesn't that make you like, oh, Gimpy Gimpy? That's like a little kid's TV show. You have Bluey and Gimpy Gimpy. This is amazing. Those barbs are filled with a neurotoxin. Its other name is the suicide plant. Because the way you stop the pain, yeah. Each of the barbs contains neurotoxins, and they're glass barbs that go on in, and they inject you with neurotoxin. And if you look, there's a lot of them. That's five millimeters. That's a lot of them. So if you were to brush by one, you'll have hundreds of these needles shoved into your skin. And we know that it causes inflammation, and you will survive it if you have lots and lots of morphine, because it's the only way you're going to tolerate the pain. And even then, it might not be enough. So if you go to Australia and you're hiking through forests and you say, oh, I did a number two. Let me wipe my butt with a leaf. Look at that leaf before you grab it. It might be a bad situation. And yes, that uh, idiot Coyote Peterson, although I guess he's not an idiot because he knows what he's doing. He's also an idiot because of what he does. He grabbed one and just did a brush against his arm and his arm all swole up and all that other fun stuff not know who coyote peterson is that's all he does he's like 
See that? That's supposed to be the most stain painful sting in the entire world. Okay, so let's capture it. And go! Which is the bullet ant. But not all interactions are bad. So we can have positive versions of this too. So the most famous of these are what we call mutualism. Some mutualisms happen, and it's nice. Others are obligatory, meaning you die without it. Obligatory mutualisms are essential for survival. Others, so non-obligate mutualisms, are just nice. An, an, an example of an obligate mutualistic relationship would be the yucca plant and the yucca moth. The only thing that pollinates the yucca is the yucca moth. The source of food for that yucca moth is the yucca. You remove one, the other dies. They are essential to each other. They are obligates. It must be happen. They have no other options. It is an insanely tight mutualistic relationship. Give me another one that you know. Well, at least you should have learned from 174. There's two that you should have learned about in 174. One starts with a C, the other starts with an M. And we find them in your cells. Well, cell. What's the only thing you can think of that starts with an M? It's the only fact people know about cells. Mitochondria. Mitochondria. Do they have DNA or do they not have DNA? They have their own DNA. How do they divide? in something called binary fission. What divides by binary fission? Bacteria do. How many membranes do they have? Two sets of membranes. Are they eukaryotic membranes? No. The outer membrane is eukaryotic, but the inner one is bacterial. What are they? Bacteria. Mitochondria are bacteria that live in us. So much so that if you were to take a human cell that needs mitochondria and you were to pull that mitochondrion out, what happens to that cell? It dies. And what happens to the mitochondrion? It also dies. It's a mutualistic relationship that we picked up a long, long time ago. What's the other one? I said it has a C. That's the chloroplast. The chloroplast does the exact same thing for plants. Uh, the thing with this mutualism is you should be able to find an example of a mitochondrion in the wild that's not mutualistic. Can we do that? The answer is yes. There are bacteria that act just like a mitochondrion in terms of what they look like and what they do. They pull off the Krebs cycle, and they pull off electron transport. But they're free-living bacteria. There are bacteria that pull off photosynthesis, just like the chloroplast does, which just further supports it's a mutualistic relationship. And we're just seeing some of the relatives that didn't go down that path. Here's another weird one. This one here is a plant, so it's this species, who cares its name, but it's a plant that lives in burning hot soil. So it's found in Yellowstone right next to the hot lakes that they have there. So 55 Celsius, that's hotter than anything that we've measured on Earth. Like that, that like Death Valley doesn't get to 55 degrees Celsius. This is really, really hot. We are dead really fast. There are plants that live in that soil. The question is, 
how are they doing it? So if you were to compare some plants, some that live in this, live and they thrive, and some that you can like move them in and plant them and they die really fast, you can start wondering, what's the difference between the two? It turns out the ones that live have a fungal infection. The ones that don't survive, they can't tolerate the heat, they turn out to not have a fungal infection. Interesting. So if you have this fungus, you can survive this insanely hot soil. Except that's not the real story. Because we can take that fungus, intentionally give it to a plant, and the plant still dies. So what's going on? I thought it's the fungus. Turns out it's not the fungus. The fungus has a virus. So the name of this virus, CTHTV, is Colveria, the name of the fungus, thermal tolerance virus. It's a virus that infects a fungus that colonizes a plant that allows the plant to survive. And if I remove one of these two, everything dies. It's a three-way mutualistic relationship. Usually we associate viruses as always bad. This is the first one that we found that turned out to be good. That without it, we're in trouble. I'll give you the ramifications of a different virus. Lots of viruses turn out to make what are called syncytia. It's a word that we're going to drop later on. So a syncytium is when you have a whole bunch of different cells that start to fuse together. So they can behave as one. Well, if you're a virus, your job is to make it from cell to cell to cell to cell to cell. Well, if I can make the cells stick together, it makes it easier for me to jump from cell to cell. So viruses are well known, some viruses are known for making cells start to like fuse together so that they can jump. It's easier for them to reproduce. Humans produce a very strange, well, not just humans, lots of mammals produce a very strange structure that is nothing but syncytia. Whole bunch of syncytial cells. We call it the placenta. The placenta is only made from this gene that produces this protein that allows a whole bunch of syncytia to be made. The gene we don't find in any other mammal before the eutherials. Eutherials are mammals that have a placenta. So the monotremes, my beloved platypus, they don't have this gene at all. The ones, so the um, marsupials, so the kangaroo, doesn't have this gene. Where the hell did this gene come from? It's the same gene that we find in those viruses that make the syncytia. Sometimes we can steal things from viruses that turn out to be useful. It's not a mutualistic relationship, but sometimes fun things come from viruses. Just wanted to say. Commensalism. So commensalism is Someone's going to benefit and the other just doesn't care. So one benefits. The other doesn't care. In your eyebrows right now and in my eyebrows right now, I have mites and you have mites. You have little bitty insects that are crawling on your hair right now. They're eating flakes of dead skin. You don't know they're there until I just told you, and now you're like, yeah, blah, blah, blah. They've never done anything to you unless you're allergic to their poop, and you would have known by now if you were. How would you know? Because doctors would have told you to shave your eyebrows off. There's some people who just need to shave their eyebrows off because they're allergic to the poop. But you didn't know that they were there until I told you. They survive off of your dead skin. They benefit, and you're just like, Huh? What? I don't know. 
That's what commensalism is. How could you show that any of these happen to occur? Well, if you want to show mutualism, meaning you require each other, all I have to do is separate them out and see if they die or if they are just not as fit. If we remove all the bacteria from your gut, what's going to happen to you? You're going to die or you're going to have a whole bunch of other issues. What does that tell us? It's mutualistic. Or at least we're getting some benefit. I don't know if they're getting benefit, but we definitely benefit from them living inside of us. So there's easy ways to test. All you have to do is remove something. With all of these organisms, one of the things that you'll have to do, or one of the things that we like to ask is, well, what types do you have? How, what are their abundances like? We refer to that as biodiversity. So all we mean by biodiversity is what's there and in what abundances. We want to know, what's the variety like? Do we have lots of choices? Do we not have lots of choices? Is it uniform? Is it all spread out? The way that we calculate it is based upon computers, which is information theory. And it takes into account two things. We take into account the variety of organisms, so the richness. Is it one species, or do you have 50 species? We also take into account the abundances. So if I look at the total, is it primarily one species with a handful of others, or is everything equally represented? So how many species, and how are those species distributed percent-wise? Taking those two things into consideration, we can calculate diversity. The equation that we use is called the Shannon Diversity Index. And here, it's, a, a, it's written as an H. I don't know why it's written as an H, but it is. And basically, what you do is you take the proportion of species A. So this is the proportion of species A. And we are going to multiply it by the natural log of the proportion of species A. And then we're going to do this same calculation for species B. And we'll do the same calculation for species C. And we just keep doing that over and over and over again. So we do this for as many as you can. Once you've added up all these numbers, we just make it negative. Because we like positive numbers, we don't like negative numbers. And natural logs of fractions give you negative numbers, and that makes us icky. So if you wanted to, you could actually calculate it for different species. So if we had one community that was 25% A, 25% of species B, 25% species C, 25% of species D, as opposed to a different community that's 80% A, 5% B, 5% C, and 10% D, if you were to calculate these, and again, it's just plug it into a calculator, what you'd see is the index for community one is higher than it is for community two. What does that mean? The diversity is better in community one than it is in community two. If, the, the, if this index gives you a bigger number, it's more diverse. Is this really how we measure how diverse an area is? Yep, this is how we do it. The question then becomes, how do you get those numbers? That's a different story. That's going to be us going to Irvine next week. How close am I to finishing this? I'm not close to finishing this. Um... We're going to do these two, and then that'll be it. So if I look at this in terms of, so we have all these organisms in this area, and they're interacting with each other in all sorts of different ways. 
One of the things that we can then ask about, especially if they're eating each other or the computer falls asleep, is how do they eat each other? Because ultimately everything has to get eaten. Whether it's because it's of predation or not, everything has to get consumed because there's only so much stuff and we need to recycle it. The way that we can describe that is either a lie, the lie is what we call a food chain. So a food chain is just what eats what, what consumes what. So typically you'll have the thing that makes the food, we'll call that a producer. What eats the producer? A consumer. How many consumers do you have? I don't know, however many you need. But ultimately, the consumers are going to die. So how do we recycle the consumers? That's the job of either a detritivore or a decomposer. Are they the same thing? The answer is no. The two terms are different. Detritivores... Eat what falls off. So we shed skin. It's not dead, but we shed skin all the time. Tritivores eat the, your dead skin. You clip your fingernails. Where does that go? The tritivores eat it. They're the things that eat what falls off of you. Decomposers eat the dead. The catch is food chains are kind of a little too simplistic of like plant to an insect to a small mammal to another, you know, reptile to a bird. Like that's, it's a little too simple. So in reality, we don't have food chains. We have food webs, which is an interconnection of food chains. So these are just interconnected food chains. They do happen to have limits, and these limits are due to physics. We'll deal with the physics later. Today is not the day. We, we don't need enough. We don't need more pain. Uh, this is just a marine example. Of a food chain versus a food web. So this, as you see it, is a food web. But how would you make a food chain? Follow a line. So if I want to have a food chain out of this, I would say, oh, uh, phytoplankton to krill to carnivorous plankton to fish to a leopard seal to a toothed shark. Ta-da, done. Just start at a bottom and make it line till it stops. That's a food chain. But it also could have gone here to here to here to here to here to here. If I were to combine this combo with this combo, I made a food web. If I just combine a whole bunch of food chains, I make food webs. These have some trouble that's going to come with them, but we'll worry about that trouble at a different point in time. Okay, so that means Tuesday we're going to talk the different types of species, change, succession, not the TV show. Um, on the purple card, before you go, there's a lake that stopped existing a while ago. 